When you wake up every morning, what do you seek to do? What do you seek to be? As a follower of Jesus, when you wake up each day, what do you seek to do and to be? What exactly do you do each day to love God and love people? Maybe, maybe you would answer that kind of a question by reciting the twofold command of Jesus. And you might say, well, you know what? Each day I try to love God with my whole being, with my heart, soul, mind, being, and to love my neighbor as myself. That's what I try to do. That's what I, when I wake up every morning, that's what I try to seek to do and to be. That's a very good answer. Love God with all my heart, soul, mind, being. Love my neighbor as myself. But what specifically do you do each day to put practices around that intention? To love God with your whole being. To love your neighbor as yourself. What habits shape you each day into the kind of Christ follower who really does love God with his or her whole heart and loves her or his neighbor as yourself? That kind of question probes a little deep, doesn't it? It challenges and maybe even reorientates our understanding of our own faith. And it, and it maybe if we, if we give it some thought, it, we, we will find that it calls us to think about, well, well, what does shape and form me as a follower of Jesus? And maybe it's not really a surprise to us that maybe the best example that we have of a curriculum for Christ-likeness comes from Jesus himself, right? Found in three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, we often call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters uh, 5 through 7. Teachings on the hill, uh, really not a mountain, as someone born and raised in B.C. would define a mountain, uh, maybe more of a hill. Uh, if you've been to the to the Holy Land, some of you may have gone to the site that's reputed to be uh, the location. It's a high hill. Uh, but this, the teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings on the hill that we find in the Gospel of Matthew are really pretty much the fullest record we have. It's certainly in terms of the Gospels. It's the largest block of teaching material that we have from Jesus. The best record maybe we have of what Jesus regularly taught as he traveled throughout Galilee. And yes, this may have been a sermon given at one time on a hill, but I am sure the words were repeated many times by Jesus. And it begins in Matthew chapter 5 with, with these nine, nine kind of odd blessings and that we, uh, tr we call the Beatitudes traditionally. And the, the Beatitudes, uh, blessed. Makarios is the, is the Greek term that's behind that word, blessed, that Jesus uses. It's a, a word that means something like um, incredibly fortunate. You're blessed. You're favored. You are... Um, you're incredibly fortunate. You are experiencing the fullness of God, makarios, blessed. And it's a term that we might use today. We might use it to talk about somebody who's, um, well, maybe he's a star athlete, right? Oh, we, she is blessed with skill. He is a blessed athlete. Or maybe a celebrity or, or a billionaire. Somebody who's, who we admire, somebody who is, is uh, privileged. We might say, oh, that person's blessed. But Jesus, Jesus, as you heard in the reading that Wendy brought us, begins by saying, blessed are the poor. 
Blessed are those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger for righteousness or, or justice could be a term used there. Blessed, Jesus says, are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. I think it's fair to say that uh, many people today who may have little interest or no interest in church resonate with these themes that are found in the Beatitudes. Mercy and peacemaking and justice and so on. The, the, because these Beatitudes challenge the dominant systems of our society and, and our typical responses to life. And I like to picture Jesus making these statements, uh, not more or less sitting on, on a hill, but as he's walking through the crowd, maybe those who have gathered to hear this, this uh, teaching. And he puts his hand on the shoulder of a, of a beggar as he says, blessed are the poor. And then he, he locks eyes with a, with a grieving widow as he says, Blessed are those who mourn. And maybe he kind of lifts the chin of a peasant laborer as he says, Blessed are the meek. What's surprising is that Jesus calls them blessed, fortunate, favored by God. Because as I've said, even like today, in Jesus' day, people assumed that those who were the wealthiest, those who were attractive, those who were powerful, those who were successful in Jesus' day, just like we look at the star athletes and the celebrities and the billionaires in our day, in Jesus' day, people assumed that those were the ones, those were the ones that were blessed Poor people, sad people, suffering people, they're not blessed, they're cursed. And some may even think they've done something wrong, they've sinned, they've somehow offended God, and that's why they're poor or sad or suffering. And even today, even today it can feel like our circumstances, our identities are our choices that we have made in our life somehow exclude us from being blessed. Do you think of yourself as blessed? With these surprise blessings, these odd beatitudes, Jesus announces that a flourishing life under God's care is available to anyone. Not just the successful, not just the wealthy and the powerful, but those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst. It's available. They're blessed. Whatever your story, whatever your struggle, wherever you find yourself, this is available to you. Now, if you look at just the first three Beatitudes, you might be saying, hmm, it seems like the whole point of, of this is that a blessed life is really available to unlikely people. But the next four Beatitudes celebrate noble qualities. You get beyond the poor in spirit, the mourn, those who mourn and those who meek. You get into those who have noble qualities. So blessed are those who hunger for righteousness or for justice. Blessed are those who are merciful. Those who are pure in heart. Those who are peacemakers. And so I want to suggest that Jesus is giving us a pretty comprehensive picture here 
of what the blessed life looks like and how to experience it. These nine Beatitudes name nine distinct areas of human struggle that Jesus is addressing in this teaching on the hill. You know, as humans, uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that our first instincts, you might call them natural instincts, but I'm going to call them our first instincts, are to be anxious, to be uh, to avoid things, to be competitive, to be apathetic, not caring about things, to be judgmental, to be evasive, divided, retaliatory, afraid. All of those things are, are kind of our first instincts. For example, um, to keep us alive, they have you know there's this what they call what they call the the uh, the uh, fight or flight response. You've heard of that, right? And that alerts us to potential dangers. So that's a good thing, right? But to flourish, we have to move from just living in anxiety to living in trust. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Similarly, we... I think instinctively distrust people who are different from us. We just, we're not sure. What, what is with that? How do they tick? What, what's, she's, she's so different. But to thrive, we're going to have to get past, reach past those differences. And Jesus says, yes, blessed are the peacemakers. First instincts, though, explain a lot about what we see happening in our world. Anxiety about not having enough, right, is the cause of so much striving, so much greed. We're anxious about having enough. Our competitive instincts are responsible for our, achieve, our, our obsession with achievement and, and success. And so we're competing all the time. Our tendency toward judgment and contempt produces conflict and division, not only on a world scale, but even on a personal scale. And our fear of death leads us to choose self-preservation over courage and, and self-giving love. So first instincts, they're necessary for our, our early survival, but left unattended, they eventually can become lethal. And to flourish, Jesus says, we're going to have to rise above our automatic responses and learn to see and to act from a more complete and accurate understanding of reality. And that more complete an accurate understanding of reality is what Jesus calls the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, one and the same. Jesus claims he understands the true nature of reality. And his invitation is for us to rethink, reimagine our whole lives to see things, to see reality in a new way way. And his teachings then challenge so much of our instinctual ways of seeing. What's the signature phrase later in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, he says, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, you think this is the reality, but this in the kingdom of God is the reality. Those instinctual ways of seeing, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, to live in a new way, to see the world become different and better, we're going to have to learn to act from a higher state of kingdom consciousness. Minds and hearts, lives shaped, formed by kingdom consciousness. 
And the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes invite us to do that. The Beatitudes invite us to make nine shifts in order to do just that. And Jesus, in, in these nine Beatitudes, invites us to confront our, our distorted responses to life and to get back to that which is real and true. And the Beatitudes are that path back to reality. <clears throat> the Beatitudes name the illusions. They, the Beatitudes point out the false beliefs that keep us chained and imprisoned. So we've learned to live from a mentality of, of anxiety and greed. But what if this is a world of abundance? Then how do we live? We've learned to live as if there is no option but despair. But what if comfort and solace are near? We live our lives, we've learned to live, uh, we strive, we compete, we compare. But what if we all have equal dignity and worth in God's kingdom? You see, the Beatitudes invite us to a new way of seeing, a new way of life. Instead of the dividing the world into us and them, we can embrace each other as family. Instead of avoiding pain and not getting involved because it's going to hurt, we can do good. We can seek righteousness and justice. Instead of living in fear, we can choose hope and courage and radical love. Those are big ideas. There's lots of big ideas in the Beatitudes, isn't there? Big ideas like trust and compassion and peacemaking. And sometimes big ideas become abstractions. They're out there somewhere floating around and yeah, peacemaking is good. Yeah, mercy is good. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does it taste like, smell like? And so I want to explore these shifts, these themes, over the next several weeks. And one of the ways we're going to do this is I'm going to recommend to you some personal and tangible ways to integrate what we're learning. It's not going to be anything embarrassing. Don't worry about that. I'm an introvert just like you are. But I want for each beatitude to suggest a physical position, a stance that will illustrate that first instinct that we have, okay? What's our first instinct? I'm just uh, saying our first instinct is to hold things, just as an example, hold things close. And then we're going to learn, I'll, I'll recommend a new posture that embodies the invitation to see and live in a new way. Teachers and educators among us, what kind of learning is that called? Kinesthetic learning? I don't know. Kinesiology? Pardon me, are we gonna be running around? That's really kinesthetic. No, we're not going to do kinesthetics. We're going to do kinesthetic learning. We're going to engage what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say with using that term is we're going to engage not just our minds, but our bodies and our emotions together. And maybe that will be easier to remember and internalize the Beatitudes. Okay. Um, you know, personality, culture, life experience, all of these things shape the landscape of our lives. And as we ponder the Beatitudes over the next several weeks, I expect that you, like me, are going to find some of the Beatitudes easy to embrace. We're going to find some of the Beatitudes harder to 
to get our heads around, to get our lives around. But my recommendation, my invitation is simply this. Let's explore how the Beatitudes speak to the circumstances in our lives. And how do they answer that question? The one we wake up with every morning. What are you going to seek to do today? What are you going to seek to be as a follower of Christ? How do the Beatitudes give us some answers for that? What we can seek to do, what we can be. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father in heaven, may we live today with open hands, mourn what is broken, serve with open hearts, use our power for good. Father, help us to look with compassion, to walk in honesty, to reach past differences and to be willing to suffer for love and to live fearlessly, following the way of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.